Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're glad that you're joining with us in our online service here today at Cala Mesa. Whether it's in the morning when we first make this available online or when you're joining us later on in the day, we're just glad that you're with us as a part of our church family. Uh, there are a number of things that are going on in the life of our church family that we just want to let you know about as well. Uh, one of those is the opportunity, if you'd like to take advantage of it, to just reach out a bit to neighbors or friends around you. Uh, Pastor Kazar and some others have been working to put together some little boxes and bags of things that you can share with your neighbors during this pandemic time when many of us are kind of confined to home a little bit more than, than we would be otherwise. Uh, there are things in the, in the little package here that include uh, masks and some hand sanitizer and some of those kind of pandemic supplies that are just kind of the basic necessities of life right now as well as some more fun things, uh, things like popcorn and some snacks that might come in handy on those nights where families might gather together to play some games or to watch a movie or, or just kind of be at home together. So there are just some ways that we can reach out and let other people know that we're thinking about them and alongside of them during this time. If you'd like to pick up uh, a few of those to share with neighbors or friends, uh, you can do that by signing up on the website or by clicking on the link in the, in the email newsletter that you've received, and you can sign up there online. And uh, they'll be available to pick up on February 6th, Sabbath afternoon, from 1 to 3 here at the church. So if you have any questions, just give Pastor Kazar a call and he can fill you in on all the details. Something else we want to let you know about that's happening this afternoon is Southeastern California Conference has been encouraging and sponsoring an ongoing conversation between church members uh, in our conference uh, about ways that we can understand better the issues of racial uh, equality and justice in our church. And as a part of that ongoing conversation, they're sponsoring an online seminar this afternoon on the conference YouTube channel from 3.30 to 5.00. Uh, there'll be a link for that on the church website if you'd like to uh, click on that and uh, be a part of that conversation as it goes on today. We'd encourage you to uh, go ahead and do that and, and become more aware of the ongoing conversation that we're having together in the conference. And finally, we want to let you know about something else that we're making available as well. And that is the opportunity to... Uh, be a part of a grief share group. If uh, you are someone who has experienced some losses over the course of the last year or so, a loss of a friend or family member, someone close to you, and uh, would just like the opportunity to be together with some other people on that same journey, uh, just uh, being of support to each other, uh, looking at resources that are available to kind of help navigate that time. Uh, Cindy Bloom will be guiding us through that process, a member of our church and a counselor. And uh, for those who are interested, it's just an opportunity to kind of benefit from the support and, and pick up some resources that may be useful to you. If you'd like to know more about that, please feel free to contact me or Cindy, and we'll be able to talk more about some of the details and when that might be getting started. But most of all, we're just glad that you're here with us today. And we just invite you to continue to be with us together in this way as we continue on in worship this morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, friends, and welcome to Children's Story. Today, we're going to be talking about seeds and soil because there's a really cool story in the Bible about seeds and soil. Now, I went into my kitchen cabinet and I found a few different seeds. For example, the first one, these are coriander seeds. They're round. They don't smell like anything, but if you crush them and put them in, I like to put them in my spaghetti sauce. It makes for an amazing spaghetti sauce. I also found some fennel seeds. Now these look maybe like something, like bits of just trees, like they're, they're long, but they smell so delicious. I like to also put these in my spaghetti sauce. 
I also found some sesame seeds. You might be a little bit more familiar with sesame seeds. They're tiny. You've probably seen them on bread. You can sprinkle them on salad, on just about anything. Sesame seeds are so good for you. So the story that Jesus told was about seeds landing on different types of soil. So he talks about the walkway. Seeds landing kind of like on a regular path that you would walk in at the park. He talks about seeds landing where normal people walk. And of course, nothing grew. Now, this one's a little bit trickier. Jesus said, now there were some seeds that landed on shallow soil. Do you think anything grew from this? Yes. In fact, Jesus said, and you know what? It sprouted, but the birds came and picked at it and it was shallow and um, it didn't really grow any roots because it was shallow soil. And then some seeds were sprinkled in the thorns. Do you guys think anything grew from the thorns? Not really. The thorns choked out anything that could possibly grow, and so nothing grew on the thorns. Now, it talks about seeds falling on fertile soil. And you know what I'm going to ask? Do you think anything grew from the seeds falling on fertile soil? Of course it did. In fact, Jesus said, when seeds fall on fertile soil, you have this abundance of plants that would grow from it. Now, what did he mean by this? We can have so many lessons, but one of the ones that I want to remind you is that God has so many good things for you. For example, in the Bible, the stories that are found there, one of them is a favorite Psalm of mine, and I'll read you a couple verses. Found in Psalm 34, it says, taste that the Lord is good. Just like some of these seeds smell so good. The Lord is also delicious. Like he has so many good things for you. It says, oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. So if you're ever scared and you want somebody to protect you, you want to feel comforted, maybe feel safe. God can be your safety and your protection. It says, even strong lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in God, they will lack no good thing. These are things that you can find in the Bible. However, if your heart and your mind and your ears are like this fertile soil, ready to receive all of this good stuff found in the Bible, you will be able to get so much out of it. But if we're distracted, maybe where our minds aren't there, our attentions aren't there, it might be like seeds that land on different types of soil and maybe not much will come out of it. So I want to challenge you to go into the Bible, to find things in nature that speak of God and everything that God wants to share with you and just be ready, almost as if you had your hands out, your eyes are focused, your mind is sharp to receive every good thing that God wants you to receive. And you might just find out that so many amazing, phenomenal and marvelous things are going to come out of all of your experiences with God. I hope you like the children's story and we'll see you next week. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy.
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show.
Mesa Church, miss ya. Uh, join me in prayer this morning. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for another Sabbath day, a day we can pause and be reminded of your love, your gifts, and your promises. Help us to stay focused on those things uh, in the week ahead. Lord, we have many loved ones who are hurting. Oh, so many. And we just ask that you surround them with your care. Put the right people in their way and give them courage. Lord, we have a few people to lift up specifically 
uh, Georgie Barrett, who uh, is recovering from an injury. And then we have a number of sweet friends who are affected by COVID and we know there are many, uh, but a few this morning are Andrea Butler, Maggie Bobst, Phyllis Reeves, just a special wrapping of love around the Reeves family. Lord, we know each of them are dear to you and uh, we just ask you to give them an extra dose of strength. Lord, we also ask you to strengthen us. Give us your strength so that we may endure, that we may be patient, and that we may have joyful hearts reflecting a life in you. We ask you to fill us with the knowledge of your will so that we may, may live in your ways. And as we listen to uh, Pastor Thurber this morning, give us ears to hear your word. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Your grace abounds to me. As I've previously admitted, sometimes I struggle with listening well. And as I've tried to improve on this, I've discovered an important dimension to hearing that is vital for doing it better. It is a dimension that I have come to know and experience a lot in the context of my marriage and family relationship. For example, when our daughters were still in diapers, and boy, it just feels like just yesterday that they were in diapers, uh, and we would be at home enjoying time together as a family, suddenly my wife, Beamy, discovers something that I haven't yet, at which point she announces, Darren, Amelia, or Aria, has a dirty diaper. Now here is where this new dimension of hearing takes place. Because after I hear those words, if I respond by saying something like, well, isn't that too bad? Or, thanks, babe, for letting me know, then I haven't really heard her. Because Beamy stating to me the fact that our kid has a dirty diaper is not merely meant to communicate to me the circumstances of the moment. Rather, it is a call to action. Beamy will know if I have really heard her when I respond by saying something more like, okay, I'll go change her. To be fair, I was just as guilty of doing this, probably more so, when it came to dirty diapers than she was. For some reason in our house, if you were the first to discover it, that meant you could usually uh, pawn it off on the other parent to deal with it. Maybe you've experienced something like this in your home, that kind of uh, listening that is longed for by your spouse, or your kids. Maybe someone announces, I'm hungry. Uh, this is what we are hearing now more and more from our girls at their current age. Uh, if another family replies to that statement, oh, that's nice, then they've missed the point, right? The point is we need to figure out what we are going to eat. Or you might hear the words, my back is itchy or my back is sore. In those moments especially, in I'm sorry to hear about that or hope it feels better or thanks for letting me know response isn't going to cut it. 
this dimension of hearing goes beyond just listening to the words, but acting on them. I think this dimension of hearing is largely how Scripture says we are supposed to listen to God and His Word. At least that's what the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4 seems to imply. The main point of this parable is described in the words that Jesus says at the conclusion of the story, where he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. Turn with me in whatever format of the Bible you have or follow along on the screen to Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And we read there. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, listen, a farmer was sowing his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. I think the title that is given for this parable, in my Bible at least, is incorrect. This is not the parable of the sower, it's really the parable of the soil. As important as the sower is and as central and important as the seed is, the main point of this parable is to focus on the soil's ability to receive and, and grow the seed that the sower has planted. And Jesus describes this process as hearing. It is even more explicit that this is the point of the story by the seemingly harsh words that Jesus says next in verse 10. Go there with me. Verse 10, Mark chapter 4, verse 10. When he was alone and the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables, he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seen, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. At first glance, this sounds harsh. Jesus, are you saying here that you tell parables purposely to confuse people? That these stories are meant to obscure those on the outside all the more? That doesn't sound like you, Jesus. It doesn't sound like the purpose of your parables. I thought they were meant to instruct and enlighten more clearly who you are and what your desire to do in our lives is. So what does this mean here? Well, maybe it would be helpful to know that these words are from the book of Isaiah chapter 6. And Jesus chooses to reference this text because Isaiah was bringing a message to God's people who had extremely hard hearts at the time. They had gone so far away from God in their idolatry that when he brings the message to them, he describes them as too far gone. I'd encourage you to read Isaiah chapter 6 this afternoon. We don't have time to go through that right now and, and read about the state of the hearts of the Israelites when that message was brought to them. Uh, that even though they could hear, they, they wouldn't understand. That's what the prophet goes on to say. Even though they can see, they won't perceive. This was often the context actually described by prophets in the Old Testament when they brought a message from the Lord, unfortunately. And yet God still called Isaiah and the other prophets to bring a message to such people. I'm so thankful, aren't you? that God is willing to bring his word to the too far gone and to the hardest of hearts. It doesn't give up on us. So with this reference, Jesus is bringing to light the hardened hearts that still exist and that he, like the prophet Isaiah, has a message for them. 
The message the prophets would bring in these circumstances was certainly one of judgment. It was a, a wake-up call for God's people. But the message not only brought certainty of judgment, but also certainty of deliverance. If anything, Jesus' quote of Isaiah here would not have brought confusion, but clarity. Because it would have told the disciples and others gathered around the reason why he told the parable. To wake them up to the importance of his message. He was describing the reality of those who have calloused hearts. And most importantly, he's giving an invitation for deliverance. And the deliverance comes, he says, from hearing. In verse 13, let's continue reading the story. Jesus begins to explain it. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like the seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others like Seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like the seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. So Jesus explains his parable, one of the few times he does that in the Gospels. And it certainly seems like a message of judgment and deliverance, does it not? It is a wake-up call to stop hearing improperly and start truly hearing the words of Jesus. And Jesus uses four types of listeners to communicate this wake-up call. Four types of li listeners illustrated by four types of soil. Three that do it poorly and one that does it well. The first type of listener that Jesus describes, I would call the hard of hearing listener, won't be receptive to God's word at all. In their day, it was not unusual that a farmer's field would have some hard soil on it. That was just the nature of the land in Palestine. I feel like it's also kind of the nature of the soil here in Southern California. We are discovering it takes some work to transform that hard clay and dirt in your backyard into something, some kind of soil that grass and plants can grow on. And Jesus says some people are hard of hearing like seeds that fall on that hard path. And Satan, like a bird, is able to come in and take away what God hoped would sink in, and grow roots. When I think about the hard of hearing listener, for some reason, the visual I get is someone postured like this. It just seems like no matter what you're going to say to somebody who has a posture like this, they aren't going to listen. Have you ever noticed that? I also think that as Christians, we've gotten good at camouflaging this. On the outside, we may make sure to present ourselves as kind and, and receptive, but on the inside, our posture, or the posture of our hearts might look more like this. Maybe the posture of our hearts gets this way because we are struggling with, like the Israelites, the sin of idolatry. We are making gods out of everything else but God himself. We are putting our hope in material things rather than the eternal. Maybe the posture of our hearts gets this way because we've gotten to the place in our society where we cannot stand those who disagree with us, or who are different from us. I must admit that when someone starts po ta talking politics with me and their beliefs are different than mine, my heart starts to look a little bit like this. I feel like politics and even theological differences in the church are so polarized these days. And disagreements are normal. They're natural. But what shouldn't ever be normal is demonizing those that see things differently than us. Came across this tweet from well-known rabbi David Wolpe 
I think that's how you say his name, uh, this week. He said, the opposition is not as evil, nor your side as good as you might suppose. I think a lot of hearts would soften if we remember that, if we applied that motto in our lives. Sometimes the posture of our hearts get like this because of our disagreements. They can also get that way because maybe something terrible has happened. And we are too hurt, too burned out, too angry at others or God to have any other kind of disposition. I have a friend who's going through a horrible experience right now. What they are enduring is so hard and so unfair. Whenever I talk with this friend, I fear that their heart is getting more and more like this towards their creator because of it. It's not always easy to hear the words of Jesus when we are hurting. But it's when we are hurting that we need his words the most. If you resonate with this type of listener, this first type of listener, I invite you to bring whatever it is that is making the soil of your heart hard before God today and surrender it to him. God promises to give us a heart of flesh, but he will only do that if we allow him. Only you can let the guard of your heart down so that God can come in and heal it, transform it. That's the first listener. The second listener Jesus describes is what I call the superficial listener. This is the person who enthusiastically receives God's word, but eventually abandons it. In Palestine, the ground not only could be hard in some spots, but also very rocky. And if the seed fell on the rocky spots, it would grow a bit. But when the intense heat from the sun would beat down on it, the plant would have uh, didn't have deep enough roots to survive. Sometimes I struggle with being that superficial listener. For example, I tune into church, enjoy the music, the service, or tune into a Sabbath school and learn and grow from the Bible study and discussion. All, all of those are good things. There's nothing wrong with that. We hope you're tuning in for those things. But then that becomes as deep as I go. God's word and my faith doesn't spill over into the rest of my life or week. And then when something troubling happens on Monday or when adversity arrives on Tuesday, my passion and commitment that I had during those few hours on Sabbath withers. And notice that the text says, persecution or trouble comes not in the sense of everyday struggles and ups and downs that we go through, but because of the word. Sometimes the hardest pressure, the most scorching heat comes in the form of criticism from friends or family or coworkers or even strangers pertaining to our faith in God's word. They criticize whether or not it is necessary to follow. To comp uh, they, they criticize us on, on how we morally think of things. Or maybe they even make fun of you for following it. You know, Jesus said that if they hate me, they're going to hate you. There will always be heat that comes from deciding to follow Jesus. And if our hearing is superficial, then we will want to give up when those moments arise. Maybe you are struggling with superficial hearing of the word. If you're feeling like this is the condition of your soil today, I want to challenge you to make a commitment beyond just tuning in for church and Sabbath school on Sabbath mornings. Of course, I hope you keep worshiping with us online. But I want you to think about how you can take your relationship with Jesus further. Maybe start a devotion with your spouse, your kids, your close friend. Think of a loving act you can do for someone who could really use it. Commit to making a lifestyle change according to Scripture where you apply the biblical principles of, of God's Word in your social life, your workplace, or at school. Make a commitment to go beyond hearing super, superficially. 
Then we get to the third listener. That's the, what I would call the distracted listener. The listener who hears the word, but it eventually gets drowned out by all the other noise that they are listening to. Jesus illustrated this by the plant that was choked up by the thorns and weeds that crowded around it. Jesus describes those noises and worries as stresses of life. But interesting, he also says the deceitfulness of wealth and, and the desires for other things crowd it too. In other words, both adverse and positive things can be distractions in our lives competing against God's word. Boy, I struggle sometimes with being hard of hearing. I sometimes am a shallow listener, but I really struggle with being a distracted listener. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you are overwhelmed and concerned with so much that God's word is the last thing on your mind. Maybe it's worries at work, stress from classes. Maybe you have put all your energy and passion on desiring wealth or other material or temporal things that you have no energy left for the richness of God's word. If you tuned in to worship this morning, distracted, I invite you to block out all the noise right now. And let these words from Jesus in Matthew's gospel really sink in right now. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Going up to verse 19, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and, and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Then Jesus gets to the fourth and final type of listener, the one that he's looking for, the deep listener. The deep listener has good soil because it accepts the word in a way that produces a crop. Some tangible growth occurs. It is even described as producing 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. That's impressive. But I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think, boy, Lord, I am really far from being that type of soil. I mean, how could I ever produce that much? Well, maybe you would find comfort in knowing that those crop productions aren't unrealistic numbers. In fact, you may remember in Genesis chapter 26, the 100 fold yield given to Isaac. That's the normal blessing that comes from those who are righteous, who follow the Lord. Not only that, but Jesus gives several numbers of varying amounts. So the point is not that there's, uh, that our good listening will somehow produce a miraculous, huge harvest. The point is just that good hearing is supposed to produce. Jesus is concerned that the deep listener will be faithful, will be fully committed. In other words, they will act when they hear the words of Jesus. They don't respond, well, isn't that nice, Jesus? Or thanks for letting me know. No, their response is, I'm all in, Jesus. Ready to act on your word. Ready to do something for you. I think if I could sum up this parable in just a few words, it would be, True hearing captures the whole person. Have you ever seen those news or YouTube clips of people who hear for the first time through the help of those uh, cochlear implants? If you haven't, I would recommend um, watching them, but not without some tissues close by because they are incredibly powerful moments. I want to share some images of the reactions of people who are hearing for the first time. Take a look at some of these pictures. Here's the first one. Sometimes the reaction that they had was like this 29-year-old woman 
tears of joy when she heard her voice for the first time. Or they're like this young mother whose one-year-old daughter heard her mommy and daddy's voice for the first time. Sometimes the reaction comes in the form of this next picture, in the form of happy smiles illustrated by 13-year-old Amanda here. Or sometimes the reaction is best uh, expressed by three-year-old Grayson, who is just in wonder, absolute wonder and awe, as he is reacting to hearing his father's voice for the first time. Regardless of the type of reaction, it's clear to me that this moment, when these people truly hear for the first time, it captures their life completely. And I know that their life is never going to be the same. I wonder if that's what Jesus is getting at when he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, let this message completely capture you and change your life. I think a biblical example of this is found in Acts chapter 4, where Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin because they had been preaching the gospel and, and healing people. The first time they appeared before the religious leaders, Peter and John openly declared that what they were doing was empowered by Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. The religious leaders didn't really know quite what to do with them, how to deal with them at that moment, so they released them, but then they brought them back a second time. And it's at that second meeting that we read here in Acts chapter 4. It's at this second meeting um, where they say, once the religious leaders call them, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I love that last statement they declare. We cannot help speaking about it. We can't help it about what we have seen and heard. That sounds to me like Peter and John let the message of Jesus, his word, capture their whole entire life. This parable describes what a deep listener is. Someone who lets the words of Jesus just completely captivate them. But did you notice it doesn't really tell us how we can become such a listener? It seems to instruct us how we become bad listeners, having hardened hearts, being superficial and distracted. But it doesn't really tell us how we can listen in a way that produces the crop. How do we get that good soil? Well, may I suggest one how-to I think we could glean from the text. Even though the parable doesn't explicitly make a point to give us one. If you notice, after he tells the story, Jesus only explains it to his disciples after they have gathered around him and ask him to explain it. Maybe that's the secret. The secret to ensuring that we truly hear the words of Jesus is to simply be around him. That's why the disciples are described as insiders here as ones that can understand the mystery, because you don't have to read much further in the Gospels to realize that the disciples are going to have their own hearing problems. They're going to struggle to comprehend Jesus' words. They will be at risk to become an outsider just as much as anyone else. The disciples are no different from anyone in needing explanations for the parable. But they are different from the outsiders in that they are committed to coming around Jesus for the explanation. If I could give one suggestion on how to truly hear the words of Jesus, it would be this. Gather close around him. Earnestly seek him out in, in prayer every day in your life when you're troubled by something. Relentlessly search his word when things in your life don't make sense. And in the good times, praise him. In every moment of every day, stay close to Jesus and you will be receptive to his word. You will start to have that good soil. Family, if you're anything like me, sometimes you are hard of hearing. Today, God is calling us out of that 
state of deafness or shallowness or distracted life and into a life that truly hears his word. So gather yourself close to Jesus now and every day. Let him soften your heart, open your ears, and use you to produce an abundant harvest. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for being a God who is patient with us, who are sometimes hard of hearing, sometimes uh, distracted. Sometimes, Lord, we're so superficial with you. I know I struggle with that at times. But thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us, for being a God that is willing to bring your good news even to the hardest of hearts. So, Lord, we want to let our guard down and we want to invite your presence into our lives. We want you to give us a heart of flesh. We want to have that kind of soil where we would be deep listeners of your word. And we wouldn't just read it and say, oh, that's nice. But, Lord, we would act on it. We would apply it. We would allow you to produce something in and through us that would do great things for your kingdom. Lord, I thank you that it is by your power, the power of your presence in our life that that we're even able to start doing this. And we invite your presence to start changing the way we hear your words today. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.